Hi, welcome to the 10th lecture of the software product line course, which is going to be about product line analyses today. My name is Elias Küter. I'm from the University of Magdeburg, which you can see here in the background. I created these slides together with Thomas Trüm from the University of Ulm and also with Timo Kira from the University of Bern. So, as you can see, we are in the third part of the product line lecture overall, which is about quality assurance. And product line analysis is one kind of a group of techniques which you can do to assure the quality of your product lines. And as always, today we are going to talk about three topics. I'm going to I'll tell you a bit about different analysis strategies for uh, product lines and why we do this in the first place. And then I'm going to give you uh, two examples for analyzing feature mappings and for analyzing the actual code of our product lines. So before we get started, I'm going to give you a quick recap on quality assurance. So quality assurance, usually we refer to this uh, when we mean that we want uh, no bugs in our software, no, no problems uh, uh, to assure functional properties. And um, there are different dimensions to quality assurance, and we've already seen some of these in the lecture. For example, we have seen some constructive um, measures for quality assurance uh, in lecture nine, where we, which was the last, last lecture, where we learned about how we can avoid variability bugs in the first place. So constructive um, aspects might be some guidelines for developers so they don't make mistakes in the first place, right? And um, we also have seen in the lecture eight organizational um, means of uh, assuring quality, for example, by process models. If you remember, there's the product line um, process model, where, which is divided in domain modeling, uh, domain engineering and application engineering. And usually we try to do as, uh, as much as effort as possible in the domain engineering, which we can then reuse for each application, for each product of our product line. And if we do everything right, um, the domain engineering does not contain many errors, which is good for every product. Um, however, we can also have uh, errors in the domain engineering in, in our product line code, which can then trickle down to maybe if we are unlucky, just uh, one or two products, which uh, are then hard to find out which, uh, which products are affected by some issue. And there are also other uh, issues which, uh, or aspects to quality assurance which we are going to look at today and also in the next lecture, the analytic ones. And um, there's um, broadly two branches. So uh, on the left here we have the static analysis and on the right the dynamic analysis. So today this is going to be about static analysis and we are trying to compile products and trying to find type errors and these kinds of things. And in the next lecture we're looking at testing like running the, um, the program actually and trying to find some bugs at runtime. Okay. So um, here's the next KCD which you can read. So, of course, having bugs like this in our software is usually not what we want. And um, there are several things we can do to improve um, the quality of our, of our software and also of our product lines. And one th kind of thing which we can do is uh, product analysis or pr program analysis, sorry. And when we do program analysis, um, we are analyzing some properties of a program which we're interested in. For example, this can be a functional properties, something like correctness, our pro program should do what we want it to do, but also things like performance, our program should run in a fast way, or uh, things about security or safety, which is listed here. So safety might be that uh, if you press the brakes on your car, you want the car to stop and you don't want any accidents to happen. And um, uh, we have different kinds of program analyses for this, uh, uh, for assuring these properties. For example, we can code, uh, look at code metrics. We can try to check the types of our program that everything compiles well. We can try to prove theorems, so mathematical properties about our programs. Like uh, a typical example would be we have a sorting algorithm and want to prove that the output of the sorting algorithm is actually sorted correctly. Um, there's also th some things like data flow analysis where we can uh, track the state of a variable and have a look at whether it leaks out of the program or not. This might be interesting if we have some confidential data. 
and of course performance analysis where we run our program and uh, try to find out how, how hard it is, how um, much time uh, goes into which kind of uh, functions, so doing profiling. And so with all these analyses, we can try to automatically find bugs in our software and bottlenecks, so places where we could optimize something and gain a lot of performance, for example, and other vulnerabilities. And this was all about the usual program analysis. However, we can also do this uh, with product lines, of course. And when we ask these kinds of questions about product lines, we um, usually have to ask about the products. So because, because having a product line is uh, just a set of a lot of products. So we might ask about, for example, code metrics, which products has the most lines of code or the least lines of code or what might be the variation. So uh, are there, is there actually a big difference between the biggest and the smallest product? This might be interesting. A little more interesting even would be uh, questions about the actual uh, correctness of the code and the bugs. For example, we might be interested in which products have type errors, so um, cannot be compiled and cannot even be deployed and delivered to customers. And we might also be interested in, in other kinds of things. So uh, regarding theorem proving, we could look at which products violate specifications. Are there some uh, variants of our sorting algorithm which do not actually uh, guarantee that the result is sorted um, or something like that. And regarding that, we have to always look at how we specify things. This is also not trivial, but uh, for product lines, it's uh, mostly interesting which products might violate specifications. And also, of course, there might be some products which have perfectly fine data flows, but maybe there's one product where there is an unsafe data flow and we want to uh, maybe find this exact product. And the classical example of optimization would be we have maybe a product line of video encoders, for example, the uh, H.264 codec, which can be used to uh, encode videos like this lecture. And uh, this uh, codec has a lot of configuration options, so you can consider it maybe not a product line, but at least a configurable software system. And uh, maybe you are interested in what is the, the fast configuration for this video codec. So how can I get uh, my video in the fastest time? or maybe um, what uh, configuration of the codec produces the, uh, the smallest video file. Or today is also uh, energy consumption is also an issue. So which kind of uh, codec configuration is the best for energy consumption? Which product has the smallest binary might be interesting, for example, for the Linux kernel, where you want to have a very small binary for certain kinds of embedded devices. If you recall the toaster example from the last lecture, for example. So uh, the common feature of these analyses is that uh, we usually want to analyze properties of an entire product line uh, at once. So um, we basically want to analyze all the products. And now we are going to look at different strategies for actually implementing such a product line analysis. Um, and most product line analyses can be grouped in one of these three groups, so product-based, feature-based, or family-based, or some combination thereof. And we are going to look at each of these in a little more detail. So product-based strategies. If I ask you to implement a product line analysis from just uh, intuitively, um, you might say that to analyze the product line as a whole, we can just analyze each part. And now the question is, what do we mean with part? And in this case, we could just analyze each product individually. So uh, the first product and the next product and the third product. So um, individually, but also in isolation. So analyzing the first product and the second product doesn't necessarily have anything to do with each other. So we can also potentially parallelize this and maybe uh, divide the, and conquer the work, for example, um, here in the Lego example, we had uh, all of these products and we could uh, maybe uh, divide this and uh, maybe even divide this by three. So um, I could uh, analyze all of these products and uh, Thomas could analyze all of the products in the middle and Timo the ones uh, down on the right. And uh, we could save a little bit of time, but as you see here, there are a lot of products already for this small example and it might not be feasible to analyze all the products in this fashion. 
we can try to write this down a little bit more formally. It looks uh, complicated, but it's actually really simple. So uh, when we have a product-based strategy, the general idea is that we want to have a product line, which is called PL here. And uh, as the result, we want to know, for example, whether all products can be compiled um, or verified with a formal verification tool or something like that. And the concrete implementations um, are uh, now omitted and we have abstract algorithms for these because we want to have all kinds of different product-based strategies and uh, these are given as Greek uh, letters, gamma, alpha and sigma. So we need some kind of gamma, so a generator for products. Uh, typically this is just a compiler or a, make si uh, a build system which you call something like make, something like gradle, and or as we learned in the last lectures, uh, something like Feature House or the C preprocessor, whatever, something that compiles a, your product. And then we need some kind of analyzer. For example, this could actually also be the compiler. This could also um, be, uh, for example, a deductive verification tool, which takes a specification in your program and uh, gives output whether that's correct, whether it can be proven that your product adheres to the specification. But this could also be uh, any different kind of analysis, code, metric analysis, whatever. And then when we have analyzed each product, we still have to give some kind of summary of all of these uh, products. So Sigma for summary. Um, for example, by, uh, with, a, with a compilation, we could have that each product should be able to compile. So this uh, summarizer could just uh, um, say that every uh, call to an analyzer must succeed or it might sum all of the lines of code or, or something different. And the idea is basically very simple. We um, just want to have all products. We have to derive all products. How do we do that? We take the feature model of the product line, uh, convert it into a propositional formula. And if you want to look up how that works, uh, I refer to you to the fourth lecture of this course on feature modeling. And there you can also learn how we can generate all of the products with, for example, an OSAT solver. And then we have all of these products as configurations and we can loop over all of them and generate the product, analyze it, put the results uh, somewhere and just summarize the results at the end. It's a pretty straightforward loop over all products. And that is also the potential problem, as you can already see here. Um, if we write this down for this database example with a configurable database, we have uh, all of these products here, for example, configurable database with uh, get access on Windows. And each of these products has to be generated, so compiled and also analyzed, verified, for example. And then we have to summarize all of these results, uh, put this down to one kind of summary Boolean or something like that. And these are already many products for just a, such a small example. So summarizing this analysis strategy, uh, the product-based strategy allows us to analyze individual products or the, the idea is that we analyze each product individually. Um, this uh, has the advantage that this uh, strategy is sound and complete. Sound means that it's basically uh, whatever we get from the strategy uh, as results is correct. So we find uh, all bugs which we find are actual bugs, but it's also complete. So um, we also find everything that we need to find. So all bugs that our product has are also there. And together, soundness and completeness means that we actually find exactly the same bugs as we would find uh, with a traditional analysis. So whether we find all the bugs depends a little on the concrete analysis. If we do testing, we usually cannot find all bugs, but maybe with a deductive verifier um, or a model checker or something like that. Another advantage of this strategy is that it uses an uh, off-the-shelf generator and uh, analysis. So off-the-shelf means that we can just reuse the usual generator and analysis which we would use in a non-product line project. For example, the usual compiler, uh, GCC, or the typical build system, make, and the typical analysis, for example, uh, C-log, which counts lines of code, or uh, key, which is a Java uh, deductive verifier. We can just use these tools and do not have to worry about anything product line specific. However, as I already told you, um, it, there is redundant analysis effort typically because we look at all of these products 
and some of these products are actually not that different so we are probably um, doing work all over again which we would not have to do that's the first point and the second point it also does not so it does not scale well because we have redundant effort but it also does not scale well because of the potential sheer size of products if you remember if we have a uh, feature set F with uh, some kind of uh, number of features, we can have up to two to the number of features um, configurations. Typically we have less, but um, it's an exponential problem and uh, analyzing exponentially many products might prove difficult for some applications, uh, some feature models. Okay, so we can try to do it a little bit differently and now uh, we still have the idea, okay, to analyze the software product line. We can just analyze each part individually, but now we take different parts. We do not uh, analyze each product, but we analyze each feature. So um, basically we would analyze uh, like uh, for the for the feature model with the Lego mannequins here, we would analyze each feature individually. We would look at the helmet and look at maybe uh, whether the helmet is, uh, is safe. So, uh, uh, actually whether it fulfills certain safety measures and we uh, might look at uh, maybe uh, uh, the brush and the phone whether they are also okay as they are however um, if you do it like this and I can also show this we uh, just have each feature and analyze it in isolation we ignore the relations of a feature to all other features so we might have a look at the helmet and whether it is a functional and we might also have a look at the telephone, whether it is functional, but we will not look at the telephone and the helmet together, whether they work together correctly. And if you recall this, this is a feature interaction. So if I wear a helmet and I also have a phone, I cannot telephone because I don't hear anything. And um, this won't work together very well. We have already um, uh, noticed this in this example and ignored this by putting this cross constraint here but if you remember from the feature interactions lecture we already have to uh, somehow know about this feature interaction and just by a feature-based strategy we would not be able to detect this so um, we are basically ignoring our relations to other features and are missing all feature interactions and we also need some kind of modularity to actually be able to analyze features in isolation and in this example this is basically obvious because in lego there is modularity over these kinds of uh, interfaces so a helmet can be considered a plug-in for the for the head so we need some kind of interfaces between features and as you can see above me there are different kinds of techniques where we had these kinds of interfaces we had components services and plugins uh, refer to lecture six for that um, but not for all implementation techniques uh, does this work so easily for example for the preprocessor and we can also put this a little bit more algorithmically again we are having a product line and now we it's even simpler we want to analyze each, each feature of the product line so we just loop over all of the features and analyze these features and the idea is now that this analyzer analyzes the feature, for example, uh, the feature is being compiled or, or verified or something. And usually if there are good interfaces between the features, we can also use an off-the-shelf tool for this, the normal Java compiler or something like that. If you have a plugin, you can usually compile this independently from the rest. And in the end, we are also summarizing the results. This is the same as before. So for the database example, it's pretty easy, we just take each of these feature and analyze each of them and summarize it and we're done. And one obvious uh, advantage of this is that now we just have to have one, two, three, uh, seven analysis calls, which may be uh, much more feasible than with a lot uh, number, with a high number of products. And also this uh, number of features would usually grow linearly or, or sublinearly and not exponentially. Okay, so to recap this strategy, in the feature-based strategy, the idea is not to analyze products, but features. And one nice thing about this is all errors which we find will usually be actual errors of the product line. So this is sound. If there's a problem with the phone, we will find it, but it's not complete. So um, because of the thing I explained before, we are missing feature interactions, potentially. We cannot detect that there's a problem between these two features. 
However, this is typically a little more, um, yeah, much more efficient actually than the product-based strategy because there's usually just a, a, yeah, a logarithmic number of features compared to the number of products. Okay, this is already pretty nice, um, but if you have a look at this, um, you might notice a trend that we uh, are kind of zooming out of the picture and we can go on with this and zoom out even more and then we would arrive at the family-based strategies. With a family-based strategy, the idea is now that we uh, throw away the idea of analyzing things in isolation and we analyze the product line, which is also sometimes called a family, hence the name, as a whole. And the idea is that we have some kind of elaborate analysis which should give exactly the same result as the normal product-based analysis. And this way we can define that uh, family-based strategy, how correct it is. And typically this um, strategy would make use of all of the artifacts in our product line, so the feature model, all of the artifacts, all of the codes. Um, in our Lego example, we would uh, use the, the feature model and also all artifacts, so this might be the code, but also how this code is to be uh, connected together. So everything which is at our disposal. As you can uh, imagine, this is a lot of effort and it requires that the analysis is handcrafted usually. So I cannot give you a generic algorithm as before, um, because it really depends if you are doing type checking, uh, it will look completely different or maybe a little bit similar to um, deductive verification. What is usually similar is that uh, basically often we reduce the, the analysis problem to a collection of satisfiability problems. Um, so uh, where we have a tool, a satisfiability solver, which solves some problems on propositional formulas and we have to design these formulas uh, in a very clever way, which uh, answers our um, our analysis problem. We're going to see some examples of this today uh, regarding feature mappings and variable code. Uh, specifically, um, I'm going to show you this at the example of conditional compilation and also feature-oriented programming. And uh, if we want to look at the summary again here in the family-based strategy, we would be analyzing uh, the entire product line as a whole. And if we do it correctly, uh, this is a very big if, but if we do it correctly, it's possible to do this in a sound way and also completely. So it basically gives us the same uh, correctness guarantees as the product-based strategy. However, it would be usually much more efficient than the product-based strategy, which is very nice. But the obvious uh, downside is that this requires a very careful and handcrafted analysis operator, which uh, does not even exist for many analysis problems and is usually a lot of uh, actual research work to implement. So to give you a quick summary of this uh, part of the lecture, um, we, ha we have seen that product line analyses are typically needed if you want to assure the quality of your product line because we want to usually have uh, to make some uh, guarantees about uh, certain uh, non-functional or functional properties like correctness, performance, energy consumption across the whole product line and not only for a single product, which we can also do with testing, but uh, sometimes we want to do uh, guarantees about the whole product line. And there are several strategies for doing this kind of analysis. We can analyze each of the products in isolation However, this does not usually scale because it's just far too many products. We can also try to analyze each feature in isolation. However, then we miss all of the feature interactions, all of the interesting stuff happening in the product line. And uh, we can also try to analyze the product line as a whole. Um, but this is uh, very difficult and requires handcrafted analyses. There's also further reading in uh, the book from Sven Appel et al. and also in, uh, for example, the survey by Thomas Thum. And um, as a practice, you can just uh, try to think of maybe other NLC strategies than the ones here above me. Um, how could such a strategy look like? And um, maybe you can think of a, a really a, a completely new strategy which no one has thought of before. Sometimes this, this actually happens. So um, if you're done with this, I'm happy to see you again for the next part of the lecture.